Rolling. All right, what's going on everyone? Jared Couture here from Two Cities, One World and Kung Fu Music Lessons. And today I'm gonna to be interviewing um, a very close friend of mine, I'm very excited about this, Mr. Paul Brackens. <laughs> This is Paul. He's the man. And I definitely, you know, Paul's definitely reached some really amazing, um, you know, places in, in his uh, musical mastery. And I think he would be an outstanding person to talk to you because he's truly amazing. I can't wait for you to see if you don't already know. But anyway, Paul, why don't you go ahead and give us um, just a quick background of your music, like from from the very beginning, you know, till now. Uh, okay. Kind well, of brief, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's... It's hard uh, to do. I know, it's a lot. It's a I, lot. I started playing super young. I don't even know. There's pictures of me playing piano when I'm like two and stuff. You know, I was surrounded by music, tons of vinyl. Like, my parents know more about music than I do. You know, but they're not musicians. They just adore music and are super open-minded about music. And like tons of different cultures and styles of music for real and um, that's huge for me and then like growing up like classic you know st louis public school band geek you know i was trombone player grew up left the groves missouri um which is a pretty prestigious public school music system it's it's hardcore um, it's very militant. The directors are like, I mean, they're nationally recognized. Um, pretty badass cats, you know. So um, that was that was heavy. And I I didn't start playing bass until I was 15. Um, hanging out with one of my friends, they had like a band practice, and the bass player didn't show up. And I just happened to be there, and. They were like, yo, you play bass? And I was like, no. And they were like, yeah, you do. And like somebody there like knew trombone and they were like, look, this is diatonic force up and, and it's chromatic this way, just like the trombone slide. And then I was like, wait, and like, I immediately played like the major <laughs> scale, like first try, like I played like a G major scale or something. I don't <laughs> even remember what it was. And they oh, were like, that's awesome. And they were like, what? No, you've played bass before. And I was like, no, I swear to God, it. <laughs> you're lying. And I was like, no. and then like, yeah, three months, oh, that's funny. three months into that, I owned a bass and I was in a band and I was gigging. Wow. And by the that's end, cool. like as soon as I graduated from high school, I was like playing in like top 40 cover bands like every weekend, like with you know, I was the youngest one in the band by like 20, 30 years, like for a long time. For a, I was just in that scene. That's kind of where I cut my teeth. And a band I joined called Hollywood Five, um, which is a really great, very pro um, St. Louis cover band. I played with them for a few years. And that was the first band I was ever in. They were like, you need eight tens and a thousand watt head and the bass has to be on top of the mix like and they were like all about the bass That's and awesome. so that was a really major influence on me just being on top and it wasn't like i was just grooving you know i wasn't taking there i don't even think i had a solo you know for, <laughs> for years you know um and yeah that was just 
that was really crucial on like my I guess finding a, a tone like my tone but not not necessarily mine because I'm also like trying to get tones of other like uh, that's appropriate to whatever song that we were covering which like they were all about like it was super pro equipment like these guys had all like you know so how old were you when you were when you were in that band man like 23 22 okay. 23 24 in there somewhere i feel like i'm not sure and then at another point around there, I was like a music director for an Elvis troupe. That was a really big deal. That was like, I mean, I learned all, Jerry Shep, who is one of my heroes, he was Elvis's bass player in the 70s. Like, I, I knew that dude's like sound and like how he played like, inside out. Like I got in his brain. That sculpted. Me. I don't know, man. It's weird. It's hard to say my background. Music no, that's I'm, good. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm man. sculpted by tons of stuff. I've never actually had a bass teacher. I've had private teachers, but like, I I studied with a saxophone player for a year. Like just like improvisation and like soloing and stuff like that, and like guitar players and a couple keyboard players and drummers drummers for sure but wow that's amazing so after yeah, the elvis after the elvis band like what did you continue to do um and i was playing with a bunch of cover bands i played in a country band for a while and then like a Casey classic type of band and then i started i don't know i i I had a bunch of my elders, uh, good people that I looked up to, like that were kind of like, "What, what are you doing, man? Like, you're young. Why are you playing in all these cover bands with all these old cats, like, like us? You know, <laughs> like, like they're literally telling me, like, go away, kid. You know, they're like, you need to go, like, play it while, like, while you're young, go play original music and like tour and crash on couches while your back can still handle it and like do all that rugged stuff and then when you retire you come home and you do your you know your old eight up you know cover band and trivia thing you know? right <laughs> so oh, that's I hilarious just, i kind of got told that enough that i did it and actually meeting you was like i, I had done some original stuff but that was like my first like this was a whole new scene group of people. Like some of them kind of knew, but there was a lot of people like my own age that I did not know that played <laughs> music in St. Louis. You know, it was like, it took getting into original music to do that. That's really. cool. Cause none of our generation really like not a whole lot of them do the cover that cover band grind. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Guess, so it's, yeah yeah it's crazy that's really cool so so let me ask so when did you when do you feel like you really started hard though like i mean i started really really playing the bass a lot you know at what age oh the second it was in my hands so you were 15 right is that what you said yeah yeah so 15 and then how much did you typically play like um as like, much as i possibly could okay i would literally do like my homework from the class before like while taking notes for the class i was in so that when i got out of school i could just go straight to playing bass and i was also like struggling with insomnia then. so i was like i was just up all the time like i'd stay up to like you know four in the morning on school nights like just jamming and and some of it i don't know how much of, of it was produced productive because i could have been doing more productive things in a way like my like back then i was just making like cheesy little beats like on a drum machine and like and like had a sequencer with like a little cheesy keyboard and like would make little chord changes to like play on and stuff mm -hmm. you know like this is like pre-abersol like all that stuff 
and YouTube. Wow. And yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. man. That's awesome. That's pretty cool, man. That's a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, but what do you, yeah, so, so of course, I um, mean, guys, you know, uh, the main topic is, uh, is on mastery and, and anything really, but the idea and the reason, one, one reason I just asked you, like, how long did you play in these things? Because that's the whole idea, you know, Kung Fu essentially translates to mastery through time and effort. So it's really about putting in the time. And what I notice is, of course, the people who play the most are kind of like the best, you know, at playing music, which seems obvious. But I think you've been a person who's basically played just nonstop since that, since the beginning, which like, well, I'm, no, I mean, I've <clears throat> taken crazy hiatuses, man. I've had times yeah, where like, you know, I went on like a two week camping trip or whatever. Like I didn't bring a base. Well, yeah, but you come, the, back, from the that, you come back from that, like, ah, oh, right. You know? <laughs> it's an, <laughs> yeah. It's well, funny. no. And just, it's, it's yeah. crazy how much you lose in two weeks. You know? Like, Absolutely. especially when like, you know, four hour gigs, man. Right. I was playing four hour gigs. Like, five times a week you know right like really intense on your chops yeah this is very good so yeah so anyway um <clears throat> i want to ask you who are some of your favorite uh, musical masters this is two part two part question though what do you first what do you consider a master like in your own words like what does that mean to you what do you consider like a real master of something or music <clears throat> and then who are some of your favorite musical masters? And um, I guess I would consider, I mean, there's like, to me, one true definition of master, but it, in music, it's interesting because you have like masters of each genre, you know, people are, you can be specialized. You can be, so that's, I guess that's like all the different styles of martial arts, if you will, you know? Well, Where, like at the, in Kung Fu, you, you, you know, basically everybody does the same stuff forever, but then people specialize in very specific, like just crane or somebody's right. very good with monkey and it's kind of a right. similar, but they know all the basic martial arts techniques and the foundation of it, you know? Totally. Totally. Well, which is why <laughs> Bruce Lee was special because he was like, I studied all styles. And that's another thing I think is really important. And I know I've heard a lot of great people like, all right, talk about mastery, Quincy Jones, right? Okay. I mean, he said it is quintessential to be open-minded to all styles of music. The second you start learning music, like that's, that's huge. It took me a while to open up for real. Like it took years and years for me to be completely open-minded about music. You know, I had my, I don't like country years and I don't like, <laughs> you know, whatever, you know, it's like any thing is weird, but yeah, I, I don't know. That's a, the master question. That's a hard one. I'm, uh, I'm telling other stories while I'm trying to think. It's all it. good. Those are good stories. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, I don't know. A master is someone that knows and loves something inside and out and can facilitate it and explain it and teach it. You know, I don't know. And I, in that way, I don't consider myself a master because I don't necessarily consider myself like the greatest teacher, I kind of have this weird understanding uh, that's my own of music. Like I might be able to guide or show someone, but as far as like actually teaching them like the actual rules, like I've kind of, like what I've learned of that, I feel like I've forgotten. Yeah, uh, I don't think that necessarily applies to all mastery, but that's okay if you, that's your thing too. Because I mean, yeah. there's obviously people who are many, there's some many incredible like virtuoso musicians, not many, but there are some who are not teachers at all. And that's their skill. Like they're the fucking 
they're the player, you know, it's like some people are right. just, just uh, like they're, they're play and they, and they can do it. And I think teaching is a skill too, that can be learned, but it is, but I mean, and I admire it very much, but I think that, um, yeah, that's cool though. But anyway, that's cool. So yeah, th this is good. I love what you said about uh, who knows and loves something inside and out. Uh, that is amazing and that's beautiful and that's cool. Like that's a good definition right there. I mean, maybe it, it doesn't have to be both, I guess, because there's people who have mastered things that they might not necessarily love. You know, you might, you're, sometimes you're forced to master stuff you know to survive or make a living or whatever right yeah <laughs> and uh in this sid jacobs interview i just did sid said something that I, I also say this but he but but he said this in a really funny way like uh, someone told him a story or uh one of his teachers was telling him something like look you know how often do you think you know basically talking about playing a lot saying like you need to play at least eight hours a day he said he said, otherwise you're not taking music seriously. He goes, think about this. People work a job that they don't even care about just to survive for eight hours a day. He's like, if you take music seriously, you would spend at least eight hours doing it. And, and I think that's... Um, that work ethic is <laughs> you know. rare, though. I mean, there's a lot of people that work like eight hours a day, like their whole life, and don't necessarily like grow or... Like you have to, like That's you have to too. push yeah. yourself, you know, and it, it can be really hard. I've gone through like huge periods of time where I just like, I wasn't motivated. I wasn't doing, I was literally just being, when I was home, I wouldn't even touch my bass, you know, like I, cause I played all, all weekend or, or whatever, you know, and like that's, it's hard to get out of that sometimes and like push yourself because then you find yourself at the gig like man if i was home right now in my studio i'd be recording this really cool song you know and it's like and then you're like you hypocrite you know it's like I don't know, these are like conversations and battles that i have within myself that's like, hilarious as far as that i mean it's a hard <laughs> thing to maintain and i also think it's perfectly yeah. sane and okay like to you know I, like those times that you know i went canoeing or camping or whatever and didn't touch an, an instrument for like a long time i didn't really have guilt about it yeah you know um, well, we need we need breaks too yeah and, and also sometimes you come back and, and you'll like immediately do something that was like you would have never done that in like the mechanical mind you were in when you left the instrument you know it's like that's where some of the best stuff comes from so in that vein it's like that's saying the opposite of what some of those teachers are saying it's like it's best just to stay away no, only touch it when you have to you know only pick up the instrument when you have That's to funny. and when you and when your creative level bar is full you know, <laughs> three quarters full other than that you know oh that's hilarious <laughs> <clears throat> man sid sid also told me something he said uh he said something like um i have it written down right here somewhere it gotta be right here he was saying that the one of the great musical philosophers, Charlie Parker, <laughs> said, I have it right here. Uh, what is it? Yeah, Charlie Parker, one of the greatest musical philosophers, said that if you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. I don't know if there's a more significant truth than that one. And that's what that's just I'm saying, you know, the same thing. It's like, you know, you got to live, too, for creativity. Like, you need to go in the woods or, or do whatever you want to do to live and not have your instrument because otherwise what else right. is coming and i think sometimes maybe that's when we get like man what sometimes we get caught up in playing the same stuff and we get to a level and like okay well what's next you know and maybe that's the time whenever we reach, we reach that that we right. need to go fucking live a little you know and just which have some is, new experiences maybe which is heavy when thinking about like the omni book and charlie parker you know and it's like live like to live bebop you know, which is a style of music that I have studied in the past. You know, I don't, I don't really have time to keep up on those chops or whatever, but I do, I do appreciate it. It's just, 
that's that takes some I have mad respect for people who can play Bob, like yeah. actually facilitate the Bob is intense. Yes. Beautiful it's, language. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So, yeah. and, and then since we're kind of talking about one uh, musical master who definitely deserves to be on that list, Charlie Parker, uh, I just want to say like, ask you, I know, I already know, man, you know, so many musicians, but who are some of your favorite musical masters? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's like just give me you know just a name just uh, name whatever you whatever you want. I know you know like so many people, so I but mean, you know I who pulled, are some of your favorites? You know, just start from I the top. I pulled out a bunch of stuff. All right, um, let me let me pull it out. Let's see what you got. Knowing that you're gonna hit me up, so what do we have? Oh we got my! Oh, this is awesome. <laughs> quintessential Herbie Hancock thrust right here. This is like oh yeah, this influence like jam band culture this is the jazz world speaking but that album like as far as like like the song actual proof with a bunch of changes going by and like a bar of five and a bar of three like that was that was quintessential growth for me once i finally got like my hands on the chart for that song and was like able to wrap my head around what they were doing and just jam along with it for hours still never got like anywhere i mean the you kind of just that's the kind of music you can only study so much and then you need to go like play with other players and create those spaces yourself you know, because like that album, they created that space. You can try to join them in that space that happened that one particular time, you know, but it's still like not the same as playing live with other musicians. Like you can you can learn that album note for note, but it's that doesn't mean that you can play, that you can hang with Herbie. <laughs> You know, <laughs> like, like, uh, for real, I mean, just, like that's the truth, man. Like to think about, like that they just like straight spewed that in a, right. in a moment. You know, it's just like, wow. You know, yeah. Yes. Okay, this is classic electronic music here. Eight oh eight state. So this is the type of stuff that when I first started playing, I would love, I would just like put this on and just like jam and like improvise and like solo over it and stuff. That's the, that's fun. That's kind of a fun thing about electronic music. For me. I would do that. Curtis Mayfield, live. I mean, just groove. And that stuff really made me fall in love with percussion too, I think. And like and like Bob Marley too but like yeah I don't know I don't know there's tons of stuff Duke Ellington Far East sweet I got it. this is awesome this is a like really cool like what what is this this is 1967 this is like a fusion of eastern and western music but like big band Ellington style not like Shakti you know so it's 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 different it's it's really cool i this is like all my bread and butter which i mean there's tons of brothers johnson lewis johnson one of the originators of the slap bass which you know i don't profess to really do very much but i do enjoy it all right <laughs> he's very thoughtful i love that stuff uh ramsey lewis sun goddess this is classic this is like oh. This is like Earth, a lot of people from Earth, Wind, and Fire, like kind of before Earth, Wind, and Fire are on this record. This is, this is heavy stuff. This is really cool. There's some like instrumental tunes and like they do live in for the city, like Stevie Wonder. Yeah, th this is good stuff. There's some awesome, awesome cats on here. Um, classic rock. Yes, close to the edge. Quintessential. Chris Squire is. Um, I I I really want to get my picking chops up, and when I do, I always think of Chris Squire. Like that's 
Like, I want to be able to play that stuff because what he does with the pick is just crazy. Like, he's super fast. King Crimson, more classic rock. This wow. Is quintessential. <clears throat> back, back door. I forgot I threw this in here. So, this is like a British, like, kind of proggy blues rock band. But their bass player, Colin Hodgkinson, this dude, if you haven't checked him out, he was way ahead of his time. And nobody really talked about him. It was weird. It's like, it's, he's way underground. But he's, he's one of like the greatest rock bass players, like in my opinion. He would do core. He like has pieces where it's just him playing bass and singing. Like in the 60s. Like playing chords and doing all this, like nobody was doing this stuff. Then. Wow. But the band just didn't didn't get that huge, you know. Record exchange, ten dollars download. Oh man, Jay Dilla. I mean, oh, come on. Yeah, it's awesome. This again, this is stuff I would like jam with. I put on like electronic music and like hip hop and stuff like that. I would just like jam out and like solo and i don't know i was like that's like one of my favorite pastimes you know? <laughs> right <laughs> that's awesome man family stone quintessential funk funk gospel right there marvin gay man one of my favorite musicians of all time this is a master right here that's master mahavishnu orchestra Vision yeah. of the Emerald Beyond. Wow. I have I have the book of scores of a lot of that music and I, I was obsessed with John McLaughlin for like a good two years and like study the stuff. Like there were some guitar solos that I knew on bass verbatim, like at one point that were like Mahavishnu stuff. And they have all those crazy unisons and lots of really cool like odd meter but like just really cool phrasing like like odd phrase it never feels odd it's always this like spiritual thing that's incredible robert glasper black radio wow that's awesome quintessential Derek hodge and uh chris daddy Day. there's some game changers that that album, all of these albums changed course of music, which is kind of, I think, why I picked them out. Well, Marvin Gaye, you know, just because I got a soft spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. <clears throat> wow, thank you for sharing that. That was so cool. Yeah, I got so a whole fun. bunch of stuff I, I pulled out. I've been wanting to listen to it, so, yeah. yeah. What are some of your favorite bass masters any that you didn't that you didn't mention already? <clears throat> uh, if any more. Oh yeah, tons. I mean, Square Pusher is up there big time for me. Um, I, it's it's interesting. I I do love and appreciate like all the slapping and tapping and stuff like Victor Wooten and all that like super technical in your face stuff. But like, I don't know. Some of my favorite guys are just like, like Anthony Jackson and like Thaddeus Tribbett and sure. Like Sheree Reed, like people for our generation, you know, like I yeah. love my, you know, um right but i also you know i i had i've had some serious times studying you know stanley clark jocko marcus miller you know all like james jamerson all of those guys all the classic guys you know anthony jackson is probably one of my favorite bass players of all time that's and, awesome and Gary Willis. I really love Gary Willis. Um, he just freaks me out. <laughs> really? And same with, same with Hadrian <clears throat> Farod. Hadrian Farod is just scary. And like Linlay, Marth, 
and like those guys, you know those guys, they all play with Dean. Yeah. I got those Paul yeah. fingers. <laughs> well, I don't know. There there's a difference there. My right hand can keep up, but the like the left hand dexterity. See, that's the thing for me, you know, I have I have my scar, man. Yeah. Yeah, but it's still, I mean, when yeah. I was, you know, it's, it's weird. I feel like that's a weird handicap. I, I feel like it gives me special things that I can do, but it also, I, I am aware of what it t has taken away as well. And it's something that, like that I've had to work around in a way. It's kind of interesting. It's wow. part, of, part of my sound, I guess. That's pretty cool. That's very interesting. It's not, it's not as, you know, it's anyway, I will, never mind. All righty then. <laughs> so yeah, man. Also, I guess um, uh, one thing is uh, what, what kind of advice would you have for anyone who's uh, dedicated to a life of music or a life of mastery in music? Um, work hard, be honest and be kind be good to people and be patient because <laughs> it takes a really long time <laughs> if ever for for uh it's to start you know and pay it forward pay it forward like i have been extremely blessed with people like believing in me and helping me out. And I think that's a really important thing to, to give back. Like if you can, if you can, and if you believe in the person and you know, if they deserve it, no, that's not what I mean. Um, like if you, you know, if you see somebody who's a, you know, is a badass musician and you see them working hard and they, they don't really have a ton of gigs and you're like, why isn't this person should be gigging? You know, and be like, yo, anybody I know looking for a bass player? You know, my buddy's killing bass right now. You know? It's like I've tried to do that as much as I can, but it has also definitely happened to me. And and it's every instrument. It's not just whoever plays your instrument. It's any and every musician. You know? But you like it gets you. It's you can't do it for everybody and you have to understand that and you kind of have to pick and choose in a way which is interesting but yeah maybe for the right gigs or whatever yeah <clears throat> right well, yeah. for the right gig yeah i mean honestly usually the people the people that i've been surrounded by in the last few years is like everybody knows what their niche is you know nobody's going to take a gig that they're like they know that they can't hang on it and like sabotage it or whatever <laughs> sabotage <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man sabotaging but still taking that hundred bucks or <laughs> right yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man i'll sabotage this party for a hundred bucks <laughs> yeah let's roll <laughs> no <laughs> Yeah, I I love ACDC. I know <laughs> right. all their music. That would uh, that's a terrible gig. Like if a guitar player told you they knew every ACDC song and then came in and didn't play ACDC like ACDC ruined. Yeah, <laughs> this would definitely have to be. You know, it needs to be that sound. Yeah, <clears throat> that's crazy that I picked that band out of everything. That's the worst <laughs> possible thing so specific if the drummer plays a fill don't ruin it oh man that's awesome <laughs> oh so funny all right man well i think i'm gonna go ahead and conclude the uh the interview but thank you so much this is so fun and yeah so man. good so good hearing from you, uh, you know, all these insights and you know all these cool things yeah so, i i it's hard for me to keep it short and concise you know it's all good this you know we can say what we want and have fun here it's great man so thank you and everybody who's listening make sure to check into paul's uh you know everything paul's doing he's playing with some awesome artists so check him out listen to his music 
get his stuff, you know, whatever it is, hit him up. <clears throat> if you need him for recording sessions uh, or for certain gigs, certain things. So, yeah, dig in. Listen a lot. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. See you.